Bon dia. Good morning. Now let me hear in one other language. Someone say good morning. No, oh yeah, that's English. No, I already did English. Another language we haven't used. Bonjour. What's another one? Supervat. All right. Very good, guys. Welcome to the Union Church. Please be seated. We're going to keep worshiping the Lord, and I promise the, the announcements are going to be short today. All right, shorter. So, um, welcome to the Union Church. Let me ask, do we have any first-time visitors here this morning? Great, Vanderlei, we met. And we want to extend a welcome to everybody, of course. But especially recognize those who are for the first time. We really appreciate you coming this morning and being here with us. The Union Church, we're a gospel-centered church, which means we proclaim the good news of Jesus. What are the good news? What's the good news of Jesus? That God's favor rests with man. And though that we have like sheep gone astray, God didn't leave us like that. But he relentlessly pursues us. He sent prophets, and the prophets were ignored until he sent his very own son, Jesus. Jesus was killed, but his father didn't abandon him to the grave. He raised him up, and for those who look to Jesus for salvation and forgiveness and cleansing, God not only forgives us, but he pours out his Holy Spirit so we don't need to come to a temple anymore to find God. It's good to come and praise God, but now we have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And it's not in one country like Israel, or it's not in the United States, but it's in every nation to the very confines, to the ends of the earth. Is this good news? I heard an amen. Yeah. So we're a gospel-centered church. We're a disciple-making church because we don't just proclaim the good news, but then we invite you to come and walk with us. Let's walk as Jesus walked. Let's figure it out because it's hard. And sometimes we start well, but then we, we get lost. But we're like, no, we're here. Let's walk. Let's do it. And we're also a church planting church. This church invests in 10 church plants right here in the city, in, in, in Rio, but then another 30, another 20 throughout um, Brazil and through Jay and his other ministries, much more. Because we want that good news to not only stay here, but go to all nations. Um, you have in your bulletin a visitor card. If you want to make contact with a pastor, uh, please fill that out. You can give it to the connections table in the back. Paulo's there. Mock. You can put it in the offering plate. We want to talk to you. Um, every Sunday morning at 8.30, we have a time of prayer. And so we are engaged in seeking the Lord and just putting Sunday before the Lord, but the church and the nation and any needs that we might have. So from 8.30 to 9, we're praying and waiting on God. Then at 9, we have an adult fellowship where we break down the sermon of the week before and help us to live it out. Because it's frustrating to hear the word, but not know how to live it out. So in that time, we take the word and we help us to live it out. We're going to continue our small groups in February. All our ministry leaders are on vacation. Even if they're not traveling, we've given them a break. But in place of the small groups, so you have a place to come, we have, let's see if it's up there, our Green Gate Picnic. So right next door, we have a barbecue every Thursday. We had our first one um, last Thursday, the 10th. Do we have any pictures? Are they here? There we are. Mauricio came and he grilled the food. The idea is this. You bring the meat, but we cook it for you. So you don't have to cook. And we have rice and other things, beans and stuff like that. So you just come with your food and we prepare it. And there's badminton and it's just a beautiful place. There's a pier that goes out to the water. The kids are playing their games. Some bring their bikes. It's just a wonderful place to be. So we're going to do that the next three Thursdays. And the purpose is while our ministry uh, team is taking a break, that we offer the church a place to come for, for rest and renewal. 
So it's not a kultu, it's not a service, but of course we pray and we open up the word a little bit. And uh, what is the challenge for this Thursday? Who remembers? All right. We tried to finish with a song, but we had people from Pakistan, India, United States, Brazil, Belgium, and we couldn't come up with a worship, one little chorus that we all knew, you know? So I sent everybody out, all the nations, so when you come back this Thursday, each group has to sing a small chorus, Christian worship song, in their native tongue, okay? So whether that's Portuguese or Urdu or whatever the language is, English, Belgium, French, every, that's the assignment, all right? Now don't come because you don't know a song. Come. Everyone brings their own meat, but if you're working and you're close, but you didn't go to the store, we always have extra food, all right? So don't let that to be a reason you don't come. But the idea is, too, that the church isn't buying food for everybody. If you can bring food, bring it, particularly the, not food, but the meat. Now, if there's a special salad you want, you can do that. Okay, I promise to keep this short. Welcome back, Brett. It's good to have you here again. That's our green gate. And um, do we have any others? Please be with us in the fellowship hall immediately after the service where we will have a time of sharing with one another, okay? Let us continue worshiping the Lord. Please stand. Crucify to save. declaration to the eternal living God none but you O Lord and now my eternal desire is to sing you praise I don't know how you've come this morning but our prayer is that as you leave that will be your declaration I don't know how relentless the storm has been in your life but whatever your situation, whatever your circumstance is as you have come, we pray that your eyes will be focused on the one who is greater than all, the sovereign Lord that holds it all together. Even in the midst of extreme calamity, we're going to learn a word today, raha, just tough stuff. And in the midst of that, there can be light and praise and freedom. And that's my prayer for each one as we leave here today. Lord, would you hear our cries, hear from our place of distress, despair, or even joy. Hear our cry, O oh Lord, and would you open up our ears and our eyes and our heart to perceive the truth you have set forth for us in your word. We pray this in Jesus' name, that you would bring conviction of what is true and right, of light, of love, and even sin. We might confess it, get rid of it, turn from it, and leave here lighter because we know that your favor rests with us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Well, we're studying the book of Jonah in a series called Relentless Love. And what we've seen so far in, in, in Relentless Love, God's great compassion for the wayward, those who are lost. Como uh, se chama in Portuguese? Desviado. Off track. Thank you. I have a lot of volunteers that say they will set me straight on my Portuguese, so translation, thank you. Today we're going to be looking at the third chapter. It is the second act of a two-act play, theater, book. We saw, let's jump up here, what slide do we have? We saw in verses 1 through 3, act 1, scene 1, 
And the scene is in a big ship, lost at sea in a relentless storm. But before we get there, we have Jonah's commissioning. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Go to the great city of Nineveh. And Jonah said, no. He fled the Lord. He fled the presence. He ran away from the presence of the Lord. And we asked the question, what would happen to Jonah? Fleeing the presence of the Lord. And what happened? Jonah went down, 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 down. Until the very end of Act 1, Scene 1, we find Jonah no longer in a ship, but we find him in the depths of the sea. And then we have Act 1, Scene 2. And Scene 2 opens up where? In the belly of a great fish. So we saw, come up here, we saw his commissioning, Jonah's commissioning, what would happen to him? He went down, down, down. We saw Jonah's relationship with pagan sailors. They didn't know Yahweh. They had their own God, Elohim, and they were lost. They were wayward. But how did the sailors respond to God's mercy? They traded fear for fear. The fear from terror of, of, of imminent death to the fear that liberates of worship, of reverent worship of God. Last week, we saw him in the belly of the whale. And it was a prayer. First person. Jonah was crying out to the Lord. And how did Jonah respond to God's grace to him? He was joyful. Praise. Vows of obedience, sacrifice, and praise I give to the Lord, for he has, he has found me. Though I was barred out from your sight, though I was in the depths of the sea, though seaweed was wrapped around my head, and I was about to enter Sheol, the pit, I remembered the Lord. I looked to his temple, and he saved me. Praise be the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Those who turn to idols and foreign gods, they waste God's compassion and love. But those who turn to the Lord find salvation. And so we see Act 1, Scene 2, coming to an end with the whale vomiting Jonah on dry land. And now we're about to enter Act 2. Now remember, just two acts. So this is like if you go to a theater production, they have intervallo, and you get up and you go out and you get your drink, you go to the bathroom, then you come back. This is the final act, okay? And now the scene is no longer a ship. It's no longer the belly of the whale, but it's in the bowels of the city. It's in the heart of the great city of Nineveh. I have to prepare myself. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Applause. Jonah obeyed the Lord. He went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a large, very large city. It took three days just to walk through it. And Jonah began by walking one day into the city while proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed the Lord. The Ninevites believed the Lord. A fast was proclaimed. And, 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 and everyone, they, they covered themselves with sackcloth. Now, when Jonah's warning arrived 
at the great king of Nineveh, he rose up. He took off his royal robe. He covered himself in sackcloth and sat in ashes. This is the proclamation of the king to Nineveh. By decree of the king and his nobles, let no one, person, animal, flock, or herd, taste anything. Let them not eat or drink. Rather, let everyone cover themselves. Put on sackcloth. Let them cry out to the God. And let them stop doing evil. Stop their violence. Who knows? Who knows? Just maybe the God will relent and in great compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what the Ninevites had done, how they stopped their evil and even their violence, he relented and did not send the destruction that he had threatened. Hear the word of the Lord. We're going to put the text up here. And we're going to walk through that real quickly. Let's go back to the very beginning of the text. How did the story begin today? Just shout it out. We're going to walk through it quickly. Yeah, the word of the Lord came a second time. It started just like the first act, the first scene, right? The exact same. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. And the word was to do what? Go, right? So then, what did Jonah do? Go to the next one. Follow with me there. Yeah. Jonah did what? And we applauded. This time, Jonah didn't go down. He went up. He obeyed, right? So what did Jonah do? It was a great city, right? It took three days to walk through it. And what did Jonah do? How many days did he walk? One day. Meanwhile, what was his message to the people of Nineveh? Yeah, 40 days, you guys are toast. You will be overthrown. Done. Now, I don't know if you've done a lot of street witnessing, but usually we don't do it that way these days, do we? <laughs> Some do. They have the big sign out there, you know. The end of the world is coming. Jonah literally said, your end is coming, and it comes in 40 days. You're going to be overthrown. What happened next? We plotted again. Remember, we clapped. What did we clap for? The Ninevites believed. Did they believe Jonah? They believed God. They knew it came from God. It was his word. And in a miracle, in the worst sermon ever preached, they would fire me, Jeff, if I came in here and preached a seven-word sermon. Forty days from now, you guys are toast. Okay, we'll see you at the picnic on, uh, at the Green Gate. But what was the result of that seven or eight word sermon? The people believed, and how did they show it? What happened next? A fast was proclaimed. They covered themselves. They put on something new, sackcloth, to show their repentance. And what did the king do? Yeah, he got off hit where? What did the throne represent? 
who sits on the throne of your life, you know? He sits on the throne of the kingdom. He's the ruler. He got off the throne, and he did what? He took off his royal robe. The prodigal son, we see the dad putting on the royal robe of the lost son. The king takes it off. He covers himself. He puts on something new, a sign of repentance. And he calls the people to do what? Cry out to the God. And stop doing what? Turn, folks. Repent. Turn from your evil and stop doing what? Evil and what? Is it up there? Let's see if it's up there. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Give up their evil and their violence. And who knows, God may yet relent with what? Compassion. Love. So, what happened next? How does this little scene one of act two end? God is sitting from his throne. He sees all. And what does he see? Remember what he saw? He saw the the Ninevites turning from their evil ways. He literally saw them repenting. And so the Ninevites repented in God. What's our R word? Relented. So that's the theme of the month. We saw God relentlessly, without relenting, pursuing his lost prophet. God relentlessly pursuing the sailors, pursuing the Ninevites. But in his destruction, God did what? He relented. He turned. He repented. Relent and repent in many ways are the same word. God, they turned from their violence and God turned from his destruction and his anger. And that's how we find the end of scene two. There in the heart of the city. Now, let me ask you, before I I preach about that, Nice thing about a story, a story does a lot of the preaching, you know. So very, from the very onset, what did you like about this story? What are some observations? What happened in the story that you thought was pretty cool? Come on, jump up here and we'll just, just teach one another because it's pretty obvious stuff. So who wants a, a microphone? Just say, what was obvious? What did you see? Pass it over there. Yeah. Hello. I think we got it. Mute off. Let me touch it one more time. Yeah. Okay. God is merciful. Okay. We saw God's mercy and his compassion. He turned from his judgment. What else did you like about the story you thought was kind of cool in the midst of all that stuff going on? What did you see? Shiva. God gives us enough time to repent. God was patient and he waited for, he gave the Ninevites an opportunity. Interesting because he said, when God saw all that they did, so he was watching for, we don't know, but the promise was when would the destruction come after how many days? So maybe he waited 40 days to see if these guys were true about their decision, you know. So God is waiting and waiting. He's watching and wow. Yes. Matthew. God can do whatever you think that is impossible because uh, Jonah didn't didn't, uh, believe that the the people of Nineveh could, could trust him, but God made that. Wow. God does the impossible. Do we have a hand back here? No. People are nervous now to wipe the sweat off their forehead because I got a hand there. Oh, Yes. Observations. Not so many interpretations. We'll get there. What did you see in the story that you liked? God is true, wholehearted, and relentless love. Okay. 
Any other observations? Is there anything in the story you, you didn't like? Well, go ahead there. Yes, George. It's a God's grace. He always gives us a second chance. Okay. God is compassionate, and His grace gives us a second, maybe at times a third chance. I'm sure the Ninevites had hundreds of chances, but yeah. That um, the people listened to Jonas, and also that the king obeyed God as well, which wow. was amazing. Even the top dog, it wasn't just for the people, it was even for the king. The king listened. Wow, great. Any other observations about the story, or what did this teach us about God? What does it teach us about the heart of man, who we are? You see any lessons for? For what does it teach about human, human nature? When we turn away from God, when we forget God, we go back to our evil nature. We go back to our sinful nature. Wow. Yeah. Jonah away from the presence of the Lord just went down, down, down. And, and we, that's a great observation. When the people are not obeying the word of God in his presence, listening to his voice, we have a tendency like a frog in a kettle that's slowly warming up. We just, we just become mourna and even worse. You know, we go back to what we're used to. And it's usually not loving, compassionate, and kind, is it? Any other observations of the text? No matter what we do, when we turn away from our evil ways, God dispenses his love. And then sometimes we think that we are not worthy, and we are not. Nobody is. But he loves us. And he is still there up to today waiting for us to turn from our evil ways to bless us. Okay. I have just a few pastoral notes. Any other observations you'd like to share? Thank you. Thanks for being brave and participating. I want to introduce a new word to you today that I found in my extra studying. When I study a passage, I use good old-fashioned, careful Bible study technique. I don't read commentaries. I just read the passage over and over and over and over and over and over again. So it's easy to pass 10, 20, 30, 40 hours in one passage. Not in a week, but over time, you know. And then we make observations. What color was the house? Where was it happening? We make all lists and lists of observations. Then you begin to ask why. Well, why? And then start to interpret. And then you say, well, what does it mean to me? But after doing all that, there's sometimes we miss things because we're not from that culture. Because the original hearers lived in a totally different context. So I was reading a, a commentary... I think it was Bible.org, and it was just talking about the play on words, how masterfully written Jonah is. It's a, it's a Hebrew masterpiece with its subtle differences that in English we don't even notice. And I shared some words last week, and this week I wanted to share on two ideas. Last time we talked about fear, and, well, we talk, had talked about fear and fear. This time I want to introduce a word called raha. And raha, I love it. I've been using it all week with my daughter. Because raha is used ten times in the book of Jonah. It even, you know where it's going, raha, all right? So, raha, ten times in the book of Jonah, and it has several connotation. Wickedness, Jonah 1. Go to the city of, of Nineveh because their raha ways have risen up to me. Their wickedness, their evil. Destruction. 
In 40 days you will be destroyed. That's Raha. So you have a righteous Raha from the Lord. You have a wicked Raha from the peoples. The calamity that the sailors confronted on the high seas. They didn't do anything necessarily bad. They were just workers. <laughs> workers on a boat trying to deliver cargo. And they were caught in this storm. That calamity is what? Raha, all right? So get used to this. Let me hear you say Raha. Now, I don't know, he were probably a little different, but we're using Raha, okay? Good English word, Raha. Good Texas Raha, all right? So we see it in evil. We see it in God's judgment. We see it in the calamity in a storm. We're facing some Raha here. Lord, I'm in the middle of the Raha. I didn't do anything. Those sailors... They threw the lots. It wasn't my fault. Whose fault is all this Raha? I'm just caught in the middle of this crazy world. The violence we see, in, I don't have anything to do with that, but we get caught up in it. And we lose a loved one. And it's not fair. It's Raha. How did I get caught up in the Raha of Rio de Janeiro? I'm an innocent one. Jonah's distress in the bottom of the sea was what? Raha. Lord, I'm drowning here. I got sea feed, seaweed around my head. I got, I'm at the, the gates of Sheol, the pit, death. I'm in Raha here. We went to the, we went to the waterfall. And about five minutes into the hike, in the middle of the, in the middle of the hike, we noticed my, my, my wife began to panic. She touched her leg and her pores began to ooze blood. And wherever she passed her hand, her skin began to just emit blood. And we're in the middle of this jungle and we're like, oh my goodness, everyone's canning around. And some, wow, this could be, you could be hemorrhaging from, uh, you know, one of these mosquito things. And her heart starts, I'm feeling faint, you know. And, and anywhere she passed her hand, this blood would come out. And it's like, I'm at the gates of Sheol, you know. I see the glory of the Lord coming to take me, folks. And one of the bikers, he wasn't with us, but he was following us. She was in the middle of Raha here. And he said, I've been noticing that this woman's been bleeding from the very beginning of the trail. But could it be that the red plastic sack she's carrying is the dye coming off on her hands. And I passed my hand on the red bag and my hand was all red. And then wherever I touched my hand, it looked like I was bleeding because with the sweat and the humidity. So it's like, I'm feeling better, Lord. Wow, the, Lord, the glory of the Lord has come. <laughs> I was at the gates of Sheol, but now I'm healed, Lord. And we were laughing about, you know, Wow. In the end, it was no Raha. It was just what perceived to be, you know. But in this case, he was at the, he was at the gates of Sheol, you know, the pit of death. That was Raha. So all through the book, if you're a Hebrew reading this, you're like, this is a book of Raha. And it's turning towards Raha and turning away from Raha. And everybody from the Lord to the sailors to Jonah to the king, everyone's experienced some Raha here. So my daughter, when I was practicing my sermon, I heard some raha in the bedroom. You know what raha is in the kid's bedroom. Things are flying and screaming. And uh, so my wife said, impossible. This daughter's impossible. She had thrown a can around the room. So I went in there and I said, daughter, <laughs> if you don't stop the raha, you're going to get some raha, all right? But if you turn from your raha, I'll turn from my raha, and you won't get the spoon on your little bottom, you know. So the raha comes in various forms. She repented, and I relented, and by 11 o'clock, she slept. Not totally her fault, because we're going to take her to a, a hotel, and she's so excited, and then she loses her head, you know. But this is the idea of raha in Hebrews, and it's really important we know the Raha. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their Raha, their evil way, God relented of the Raha, the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And that's how it ends. But I only tell you that because in chapter 4, 
the conclusion of our story, guess what we're going to see? Unfortunately, the story ends with more Raha. And it's kind of surprising from where it comes. The other idea of the book that you need to see is a play on the Hebrew word for God, Elohim, and Yahweh, and Ah Elohim. There's three names for God that, uh, that we just see the Lord God, and we always, dear, dear Lord God, Father Jesus, when we pray, we kind of like mix all the names and we don't really think about it. But when the Hebrews saw these names, it wasn't so subtle like it is for us. So check this out. When God of Israel is referred to in the Bible, the God of Israel, their God, it's what? Yahweh. There, it's very clear, there's no doubt, Yahweh is the God of Israel. But when you're talking about like our word, for, that's Lord. But when you say God, we have our God and they have their God. God is kind of a generic word for this big being, right? And everybody has a God. God can refer to the Lord Jesus Christ, but God can refer to the gods of, of Nepal or the gods of whatever people. It's a generic word for God. So whenever you see the sailors crying out to their gods, it's what word? Elohim. Now sometimes Elohim is, is Yahweh because it's God, like we use God. But whenever they want you to know, they wanted the readers to know this is Jonah's God. This is the Lord, the true God. They use Yahweh. But two times in this, three times in this story, they use a different name that's rarely used. Ah, Elohim. Ah is a definite article or the God. And so for a Hebrew, it's a very shocking ending because what we see is this. Go to the next slide. The central issue using these different names is this. Pagans and other nations have Elohim, small g gods that they worship. True. But they do not have a relationship like we have with our who? Yahweh. Yahweh is ours, exclusively ours. Everybody has their Elohim, but we, the Israelites, have a loving, compassionate Yahweh who forgives us. But how this, this chapter ends is pretty amazing. Because two times, the leader, the boss, the boss in the first chapter was who? The captain of the ship. When he came down to wake up Jonah, what name did he call God? He didn't use the Hebrew Elohim, uh, the Hebrew Yahweh, but he didn't use Elohim either. He said, cry out to Ah Elohim, or cry out to the God of gods, the true God. In other words, the Hebrews would see that equal to Yahweh. Wow, your God, Yahweh. Not just your God, like one other God, but the God of gods. And then we see it here in 3, chapter 9 and 10, in the decree. If everyone cries out to who? Not Elohim, and he didn't use the Hebrew Yahweh, he used Ah Elohim. Everyone cry out to the God of gods. Maybe he is different than other gods and he will treat us with kindness and compassion. But what was most shocking here, the narrator, the one who wrote this story, he didn't finish saying, yeah, Yahweh relented. He used the pagan usage, the pagan's term, his own term, you were right. Ah, Elohim relents. The God of God relented. So when the Hebrews saw this, when they read this, this is what they saw. Go to the next slide, please. Wow! The Ninevites are now like us, having a loving and compassionate relationship with Yahweh. Because the narrator of the book switched to Ah, Elohim. The God of gods. Cry out to the God of gods, the foreigner says. He didn't know the name of Yahweh. But then the narrator says, doesn't say, no, his name is Yahweh. He said, you're right. He is the God of gods. And the reader of this book is offended. 
because he's including the Ninevites under the compassionate Yahweh's care and forgiveness. And it sets up some raha between God and his prophet in the last chapter. Is it fair to offer Yahweh's compassion to non-Israelites? Well, we're not Israelites. So, pastor, what does this mean to me? Let's look up here. Real quickly, yeah, go through here. Put up, put up this. We see Jonah's going down, down, down. We see the pagan sailors turning to the, to, turning to the, 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 God, the, the, the God of gods. We see Jonah saying, praise the God of gods for his compassion for me. Then today, what did we see? Jonah's recommissioning and obedience, compliance. What happened to Jonah? Was he killed by the king? No, the people believed. Go ahead. It's a parallel to two acts. We have Acts 1 on the left and Act 2 on the right. Go to, go to the next one. Jonah and the pagan Ninevites, just like Jonah and the pagan sailors, the Ninevites also responded to God's compassion. Well, Jonah responded to his, his own situation. And now the next one. In the last chapter, we're going to see how Jonah responds to God's grace for others. For us today, we're going to finish with this. We don't... Okay, I'm going to go... I did... I, I have some raha in my life, so I'm going to go home and put on sackcloth. Where did you get that, Pastor? Because I need to wear some of this stuff, you know? I'm going to fast and sit... And, and, and I'll even go to the beach like this, you know, just to show, Lord, okay, are you looking here 40 days and, and bring some relief, you know? Compassionate, compassionate God. Well, I thought of, go to the next slide, please. Let's bring up the, uh, the table there. Yeah. In the New Testament, through the grace of the cross that Jonah didn't have, that we have, instead of putting on sackcloth, what does the Scriptures teach us to put on as a sign of repentance? Take off the old man, the old self, and put on the new self. So this stands as a reminder. We don't need this anymore. But we have the Holy Spirit. So turn from the raha. What's the raha? Falsehood. Anger. Stealing. Unwholesome talk. Bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander. Put it off. But what's the new how do we repent today? What's it? You remain in the presence of God. You listen to His voice and respond to the Spirit of God. What's this fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Speak truthfully to your neighbor. Work with your hands. Don't steal. And the Scriptures say, so that you may bless others. So you who were poor and were stealing... Go to work, work with your hands, so that you might be not a curse to people, but a blessing to people. He who works and gets a return, bless people. Helpful talk, not unwholesome talk. Building up people. The fafaka ends here. Instead of bitterness, rage, and anger, we have kindness and compassion, forgiveness to one another. This is what God is calling us to and as the band comes forward, we're going to call the worship team. We're going to close with two offerings today. We're going to do our, our normal offering, tithes and offering. In the New Testament, we're taught, loved ones, you are not under law anymore. By law, we're not going to write your name and see if you gave 10% a jizmu. That was the Old Testament law, but if your life has been touched by the Lord, give and give, give beyond 10. 10% should be a starting place. Why? Because you're investing in the kingdom of God. You're investing in the church plants. You're investing in the ministries of the church. So we're going to do a tithe and offering. That's between you and the Lord. We don't want to know about it. And then, when that's over, we're going to do an offering of ourselves, a time of prayer where you can come forward. You don't have to wear sackcloth, but we can put off the old man. And we can pray for you if you're experiencing some raha in your life and you want prayer. 
if you want to know how to put on the new self through the Holy Spirit, if you want to know how to conquer anger, bitterness, if you want to know how to practice kindness and compassion, if you want to ask the Lord to help you in some truthful areas of your life, we want to receive you for, for prayer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you even for the Raha in our lives because it shows us that we all fall short of your glory. And yet what's incredible to think that even though we have this Raha against you, you relent for sending us what we deserve. You put that on your son, Jesus. I just pray now as we sing, you would receive our praises as an offering, as a starting place, because salvation does belong to the Lord. But I pray to you, be working in our hearts that you would bring freedom to those who are in the midst of the Raha and they need to see a relentless God pursuing them. They need to see a loving and compassionate God relent from the, from the hardship and the, and the difficulties they've been passing through. Receive our praise before you, O Lord. Amen. Lord, we just thank you for these sacrifices, for the resources that we have, that we might continue to be a light on this earth. Use them for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the second offering we're talking about has nothing to do with money. One of my dear friends and brothers said, what's this second offering now you're asking for, Pastor? No, we're not asking for money. It's a living offering. We're told to be a living sacrifice unto the Lord, where we no longer conform to the patterns of this world, but we offer our hearts and our souls and our minds in praise to the living God. And we say, Lord, done with the Raha. You have relented from your Raha, you've put it on your son. Now receive me as a child. I want to be obedient to your word. And this is where we bow the knee, we say. If you'd like to bow the knee, maybe not for the first time, but just, you know what? I just need to bow the knee to the Lord today because I'm in the midst of some stuff and I just want to, I just want to be a living offering of praise to the name, to the name that is above all names. One, Jesus. But we stood here and talked about Jesus, the one, the eternal one, the one from beginning and the end, the creator, sustainer, the reconciler of all things. I want to bow the knee. This is a time if we can put up here, well, we have words of the song, we don't worry about. But this is the table that we put up there. Lord, I want to put off the royal robes of, I don't want to be on the throne of my life anymore. I'm going to throw off these my own royal clothes I'm going to put on yours the new self I want you to sit on the throne of my life so the second offering is basically just saying Lord be Lord of my life today and I do this daily because I just realize whether it's in my marriage or as a dad or as a pastor or, or in so many different roles we have it's easy to become the, th the one enthroned but then I realized, where's this anger coming from? Where's this fear coming from? Where's this malice coming from? Why, when that guy goes by me and looks at me the wrong way in the road, I'm visioning of how I'm going to pull his car over and get him and rush him, who's boss? Wait, is that the spirit? <laughs> is that the same pastor preaching the end of calamity and the end of Raha? So, Lord, where does this come from? So this is a, as we sing and praise and offer to come. And what we do is, if you'd like to receive prayer and just bow the knee, come forward. And we ask ministry leaders who are here, uh, Carol or, or uh, anyone that's leading a small group, not that is here. Uh, if you're involved in a small group and you have that gift and want to come up, and, and come up and pray with the people who come forward. Um, it's just between you and the Lord, but we want to we want to receive you and pray with you talk to the person next to you. Would you like to go up for prayer for anything? And uh, be willing to come. And that's what this second offering is about.
enough to thank you there are the words to express my praise but I will lift up my voice thank you from my heart with all of my strength hallelujah beginning folks it's it's a uh, as in in um, chapter 2 of Jonah from the depths of the, the belly of the whale Jonah said I vow to do this because <laughs> he was in this belly he couldn't do it then but we can do it now but we say we proclaim the good news you've heard the good news you sense the presence of God in your life but this is a first step the discipleship step is important. You must remain in the Lord. The Spirit comes and He seals us. We feel it. But you must remain in the Lord. And one of the things that we offer here is times of fellowship. Times together. Our small groups. And though they're not meeting right now, 
Thursday we'll be together again. It's another opportunity to be together. Do not afastar, se afastar. Don't desafiar. What do we say that? Go wayward. You've made that step. You've come forward. You receive prayer. But stay close to other brothers and sisters in Jesus. If you need a call from the pastor, a visit, give a call. If I can't make it, we'll send somebody out to be with you, to pray with you. Okay? We want to... Discipleship is the call to follow Jesus in community together. Amen? Well, receive the benediction. God is in the business of doing impossible things. And the good news is it's nothing new. It's just our time. He's been doing this from the beginning of time. And now it's our time to respond to the one who does impossible things. The one who takes one raha and he turns it into calm and peace. And so I send you out today, church, in the name of this one, the name of Jesus, that brings calm, peace, and healing to our lives. Go and proclaim to the nations as you come and go. And I know as we do, that there's no anger anymore. God has placed that on his son. Leave your raha behind. Give that person a hug in your life that, that's in the raha and tell them, let it go. Turn to Jesus. He's taken it. And receive the love of the Father. Go, church, in this name, in this power. Amen.